Ladies and gentlemen, today we unravel a tale that seems straight out of a spy novel, complete with secrecy, international intrigue, and a shroud of uncertainty. On Saturday, November 16th, Ugandan opposition leader Dr. Kiza Besige arrived in Nairobi to attend a book launch hosted by Martha Karua, the NARC Kenya party leader. It was supposed to be a routine visit, an opportunity for political allies to network and exchange ideas. But what unfolded was anything but routine. According to security sources, what Dr. Besige may not have known was that agents of Uganda's intelligence service were tracking his every move. Reports suggest that these operatives alleged he had conducted several high-level meetings in Nairobi, including one that they claim was a fundraiser. What was the purpose of this fundraiser? And why would it attract the attention of spies? Funga! Fungua! Asante! On Saturday evening, after attending the event, Dr. Bassi reportedly left his hotel in Hurlingham, Nairobi heading to an address at 108 Riverside Drive. It was there, in apartment C. Wavando 2, that his trail went cold. For hours, his taxi driver waited in the building's basement, 12 long hours to be exact. Texts went unanswered, calls ignored. At 4.30am, the driver finally gave up and left. That would be the last time anyone would see Dr. Besici on Kenyan soil, Days later, whispers of his sudden disappearance began to surface. According to confidential sources, a top-secret operation had unfolded that night. It is said that Ugandan intelligence agents, possibly with the cooperation of Kenya's National Intelligence Service, seized Dr. Besigye and spirited him across the border by road to Kampala. Fast forward to Wednesday, November 20th. Dr. Besigye and his ally, Hajj Obeid Lutale, appeared before a Ugandan military court. The charges? Allegedly plotting against Uganda's military targets. The prosecution claimed the intelligence gathered from Nairobi proved their case. But here's where it gets murkier. The Kenyan government flatly denied any knowledge of Dr. Besigye's abduction. Nairobi Regional Police Commander Adamson Bungai stated that no such incident had been reported. Even Kenya's National Police spokesperson, Rasila Atieno Onyango, seemed caught off guard, insisting she was unaware of these allegations. So what really happened on that fateful night at Riverside Apartments? Was this an elaborate covert operation? orchestrated by Ugandan authorities alone? Or did it involve Kenyan officials? Why did the Kenyan government deny involvement, despite mounting evidence pointing to a coordinated effort? On the evening of Tuesday, whispers of intrigue began circulating. A source familiar with Dr. Kiza Basia's sudden disappearance hinted at a clandestine meeting planned that Saturday night. According to the source, Dr. Besigi had informed his team he was heading to Riverside Drive to meet a Ugandan national, an individual whose identity remains a closely guarded secret. Speculation is rife that the mysterious host was no ordinary citizen but a senior officer in the Uganda People's Defence Forces, UPDF. The apartment where the meeting was to take place, Block C at 108 Riverside Drive, exuded an unsettling silence during a fact-finding visit. On the 11th floor where Dr. Besigi reportedly went, three apartments stood shrouded in darkness, the corridor eerily devoid of any sign of human activity. Nation reporters knocked on the door of apartment number two, the location where Dr. Besigi was last seen entering, but their efforts were met with silence. The door remained firmly shut, concealing whatever secrets lay within. Adding to the mystery, CCTV footage from the night remains inaccessible. 
leaving questions about what transpired behind those closed doors unanswered. Meanwhile, tension grew among Dr. Besigi's allies. I think I can only give the reports as uh, uh, received from the family. Firstly, I had invited the Honourable Kisa Besige to my book launch on the 17th afternoon, that is Sunday. An aide to NARC Kenya leader Martha Karua revealed the growing alarm that night. We knew he was coming, but when he didn't show up, we called to check. At first, the calls went through, but then his line went dead. It's been off ever since, the aide shared. Back in Uganda, Dr. Besige's team grew increasingly desperate, bombarding their Kenyan counterparts with calls seeking any information about his whereabouts. Funga! Fungua! Asante! Dr. Besige's absence was most keenly felt the following day at Martha Karua's book launch, as the convener of the Pan African Opposition Leaders Solidarity Network where Dr. Besigi is an esteemed member, Karua had prepared to host him as a keynote speaker. Yet his empty chair at the event was a stark reminder of the growing enigma surrounding his disappearance. Winnie Bayanyima, Dr. Besigi's wife, later confirmed the worst in a post on X. She revealed that her husband was being detained in a military facility in Kampala. She called for his immediate release, describing the ordeal as a blatant act of abduction. But the plot thickened. When Dr. Besigi and his ally, Haj Obeid Lutali, were presented before a Ugandan military court, the charges against them raised more questions than answers. The court alleged that the duo was found in possession of ammunition at the Riverside Apartments in Nairobi. Eight rounds of pistol ammunition, to be exact. This wasn't just about firearms, though. Prosecutors claimed that Dr. Besigi and Mr. Lutale had orchestrated a series of meetings in Nairobi, Athens and Geneva. Their objective? To solicit support and identify military targets in Uganda. Allegedly, these activities spanned from October 2023 to November 2024, painting a picture of an international conspiracy. However, lead defence lawyer Arias Luquago dismissed the charges as baseless. These allegations are riddled with ambiguity. The offences, if any, occurred outside Uganda's jurisdiction. The UPDF Act does not extend to Kenya, Greece or Switzerland, Luquago argued. He maintained that the charges were a ploy to silence Dr. Besigi and his allies. As the courtroom drama unfolds, one critical question lingers. What really happened behind the tightly shut door of apartment number two on Riverside Drive? Could this meeting have been a setup or was it a genuine encounter with a tragic twist? And who exactly is the unnamed Ugandan official believed to be at the centre of this saga? As the court drama unfolded, the defence raised a crucial concern about the legality of Dr. Besige and Hajj Lutale's transfer from Nairobi to Kampala, a move shrouded in secrecy and controversy. The defence, led by Arias Luquago, argued that the process through which Dr. Besige and his ally were brought back to Uganda blatantly disregarded international and legal protocols. According to Luquago, the accused persons entered Nairobi lawfully for a legitimate meeting. Once you're in a foreign country, the only lawful way to return is through extradition or deportation. In cases of extradition, a formal request must be made by the relevant minister, followed by judicial processes in the host country. Deportation, on the other hand, requires the host country's authorities to act after identifying a legitimate cause. Luquago claimed no records of such actions existed, rendering the entire operation illegal. The murkiness surrounding their transfer raises significant questions about whether Kenyan authorities played a role, or if this was a covert operation by external forces. Meanwhile, the Pan-African Opposition Leaders Solidarity Network, led by Martha Karua, decried the abduction and subsequent detention of Dr. Besige. In a strongly worded statement, 
the network condemned what they described as a blatant violation of human rights and demanded immediate answers about his condition and safety. As Bessiger and Lutal remain remanded until December 2nd, the questions surrounding their sudden disappearance in Nairobi and the legality of their detention continue to stir heated debates across the region. Dr. Bessage's abduction has sparked a storm of outrage, with critics pointing fingers at both the Kenyan and Ugandan governments for blatantly violating national, regional and international laws. This troubling trend raises questions. How far will governments go to suppress dissent? And who is truly safe if sovereignty and international law can be so easily disregarded? As we conclude this chapter, we leave you with these questions. Where does the balance lie between national security and human rights? Who will hold these governments accountable? Stay tuned to Life Lens TV for our upcoming analysis, where we'll dive deeper into the implications of these actions on regional politics and global diplomacy. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more in-depth stories that matter to you. See you in the next one.